um, Joyce Ardeby has, you know, her, her sister, Sister Jeannie, has been dealing with COVID, and she is not doing well. So we need to pray for Jeannie and pray for Joyce as she's anticipating having surgery. Also, the Zito family, the memorial service was today. He'll be buried at the Great Lakes National Cemetery tomorrow morning. John and Diane just do a really good job with the funeral dinners, don't they? And for those of you who helped, that's greatly appreciated as well. Here it is, Jeannie's, I mean Joyce's knee surgery is January 5th. George Salovix had surgery today, um, and he's doing well after that. We need to continue praying for our, our new Christian sister, Vicki Stoika, and the liver problem she's having. Uh, Jim and Carol Warren's daughter-in-law, Kara, is expecting. And as of right now, they're planning on doing a cesarean Monday, January 3rd. So we need to pray for her. Nancy Jessic's grandson had hip surgery, and he's recovering from that. And Jessica Bird asked us to pray for her cousin Jane, who's having some health problems. Anybody else we need to add to our list? Marvin? Okay. All right, Karen. Okay, Beth's son. And Vicky. So Beth has COVID. Mm -hmm. Okay, who else? Not who else has COVID, who else needs to be prayed for? I have about three in my family, so just put the Everson family, the Nevis family. How's Alice? Have you gotten an update on Alice? Not much better. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Jeff Clark. So Jeff. He does have COVID. So Quarantining. Any others? Okay, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for the day and for the opportunity to be together and study of your word this evening. We ask your blessings on us as we study. We pray, Father, that you will help us to keep our uh, personal opinions out of the text. Help us to draw conclusions from the text that you intend us to draw. And help us, Father, to submit our lives to the teaching of your word so that we can glorify you through our lives. We pray that you'll bless us tonight, Father. Bless us through this holiday weekend. We'll spend more time with family and friends. And we pray that you'll bless the time that we spend together. We pray that you will keep, uh, keep us safe. Those who will be traveling through the holidays. We pray that you'll bless... Uh, Joyce's sister, Jeannie, we pray that you'll heal her father. Uh, and we pray that she doesn't have any uh, serious repercussions from COVID. We pray that you will bless Pam Zito's uh, family as they uh, adjust to the passing of Rob. We are thankful, Father, that he was a Christian. And we praise you, Father, for saving him. And we pray that you will comfort the family as they adjust to a new normal in their lives. We ask your blessings on Gail and her family, her daughter-in-law especially, she deals with COVID. And we pray that none of the other members of the family will get it. We pray that you'll heal her. We pray, Father, for Beth and Dylan and Joey. We pray that you'll heal each, each one of them also, as well as Vicki and others uh, in our church family and, and friends who have the virus. We pray that you'll heal each one. And uh, for, for Jeff, Father, we pray that he doesn't have it uh, as he quarantines. We pray for the Everson family, Father, also, and those who are dealing with the virus, that you will heal them. We're thankful that George's surgery went well today, and we pray that you'll bless him as he heals.
from that surgery. Bless Vicki as she deals with the liver problems. We pray that you'll bless her and heal her father in, in any way possible and that she will have better health and she can be with us in Bible study and worship as frequently as possible so that her spirit can be strengthened. We pray for Jim and Carol's daughter-in-law and her, her pregnancy. We pray that things will go well for her to have this cesarean on Monday uh, if that's what's best for her and her baby. And we pray that uh, she will do well and her baby will be born healthy. And bless Nancy Jessica's grandson as he heals from this hip surgery and Jessica Burt's cousin as she deals with her own health issues. Uh, please bless all of those in our church family who are dealing with various health issues. Uh, and we pray that you will strengthen our faith, Father, to endure the things that we endure in life uh, so that we can be faithful to you, so that we can enjoy a home in heaven with you when this life is over. Again, we ask your blessings, Father, on this study tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, we will be in Ezekiel. That'll be the first place we get to if you want to be finding it and getting to it. Last week, we started looking at prophecies of the coming of the kingdom. And just to give you kind of a chronological perspective, because I think these are some things as far as Bible history are concerned that's important to know, there are certain red letter dates, you know, that everybody, every American needs to know. They're just important dates in American history. Well, there are certain important dates in biblical history that every Bible student should know. We ended last week reading some of Isaiah's prophecies. Um, Isaiah lived about 700 years before Jesus came. Uh, tonight we're going to read some prophecies of Ezekiel and Daniel. Ezekiel and Daniel and Jeremiah were all contemporaries. They all lived about the same time. They all lived about 600 B.C., 580 B.C. or so. Ezekiel and Daniel were carried off into exile by the Babylonian nation. Daniel was put into service to the king. So Daniel was serving the king in the palace. Ezekiel was with the common Jews in Babylon in an encampment, a settlement by the river Kibar. Now, after we study Numbers in the summer, the next Old Testament book we'll study will be Ezekiel. So that'll give you something to greatly anticipate. Jeremiah was left back at home, back in Judah. And so all three of these men are preaching uh, roughly at the same time. Now, they, li they, they are in Babylon for 70 years. Jeremiah told them to go into Babylon, build your houses, and settle down, because you're going to be there for 70 years. And that's because of their, their idolatry. It's because of their, their immorality. Their immorality grew out of their idolatry. When you create a god after your own image, which is what idolatry is, then you can live any way you want to. Because <laughs> if you don't like, I mean, you can't not like what that god says because you created the god, right? So God said, you're going into exile for 70 years. And, and in fact, when we open up the New Testament, the Jews are not guilty of idolatry anymore. They don't ever struggle with idolatry again. God cured them of that. Now, Babylon was taken over by the Persians. That is told at the very end of 2 Chronicles and at the very end of Daniel chapter 5. Okay, so the Persians take over Babylon. And Israel is the doormat in all of these uh, this, this international chess game that's going on with all these, these major world powers. Media was a world power, but then they were taken over by the Persians. And we'll talk about the Medo-Persian Empire tonight when we look at Daniel. So then the Persians take over. And then after the Persians are in power for a few hundred years, then Alexander the Great, everybody's heard of him, he and the Greeks take over the world. And then they rule the world for a couple of hundred years, and then they're taken over by the Romans. The Romans overtake the Greeks. The last battle between the Romans and the Greeks was the Battle of Actium, which was in 31 B.C. Now, Jesus was born in 4 B.C., 
And so for Rome to take over Greece finally in 31 BC, then that's only, what, 20, 25 years or so before Jesus comes to earth. So that gets us up to the time of Christ. Now, here in Ezekiel is where we're reading right now. So Ezekiel is with the Jewish settlement by the river Kibar. These are the Jews that were carried off into exile. They're in Babylon. And they're, they're wondering why on earth has God caused this to happen? The Messiah is supposed to come. There's supposed to be a, a, a descendant of David always reigning over the nation of Israel. Where is he? So they are disillusioned. They are discouraged. I'm talking about those who are faithful. They're being punished, you might say, in a sense, because of the idolatry of everybody else. You know, sometimes even faithful people get punished when the punishment is universal, when it's nationwide. And so they're separated from their family and friends and their homeland, and they're in Babylon. So somebody read Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 23 through 24, because this is picturing the coming of David. Somebody read those two verses for us. We are many. The land has been given to us as a possession. Is that the right one? Okay. Maybe I wrote down the wrong passage. So it didn't sound familiar to you, huh? Chapter 33, verses 23 and 24. Hmm. Well, let's just uh, go on and read chapter 37. Maybe I, maybe I can find that other one while we're reading chapter 37. Sometimes your fingers just don't do what your brain tells it to do, you know? Okay, chapter 37, verses 24 and 25. Somebody read those two verses for us. They will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob, in which your fathers lived. They will live in it, they and their children, and their grandchildren forever. David, my servant, will be prince over them forever. So you want to start there you go. I found it at the same time you did, Cody. All right, so turn to chapter 34, verses 23 and 24. But back to the text that, that, that Mark read... Pay attention now. Ezekiel says David is going to rule over them. David is going to rule over his people. So what Ezekiel is doing is he's taking that promise that God gave to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and he's moving it forward, not to his time, but to some time in the future. David is trying to encourage his fellow Jews, listen, I know it's hard now, I know we're separated from our homeland now, but God is promising, still promising, that he's going to send David, by which he means a descendant of David, to reign over his people. Okay, so let's go back to chapter 34 and read verses 23 and 24. Donna, Don, why don't you read that one since we messed you up earlier. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my servant David. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Okay, so this repeats the same promise that we just read in chapter 37. So again, Ezekiel is saying David is going to rule over God's people. That is a descendant of David. We're not going to read these other verses because I want us to get to Daniel. But Hosea and Amos predict the, uh, the coming of David. Amos specifically says the rebuilding of the tabernacle, the house of David. And specifically, and this relates to us talking about the revelation of the kingdom of God, Amos chapter 9 verses 11 and 12 is quoted in Acts chapter 15 verses 16 and 17 as being fulfilled in the church. 
Now, for those of us who've been in the church for a while, that's not a surprise. You knew that was coming. But what that helps us understand is that the kingdom we're going to see is established by Jesus Christ during the days of His, his lifetime, His contemporaries, His audience. I don't know if we'll get that far tonight. I did in my office, but I'm, I'll go farther in my office than I do in here. Okay, so now Zechariah. Zechariah chapter uh, 12 and verse 10. Uh, they will look on him whom they have pierced. You recognize that as being fulfilled in the crucifixion of Jesus, John uh, chapter 19. Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1, which is just a few verses after that. Zechariah says, in those days a fountain will be opened for sin and for impurity. So what Zechariah is predicting is that when David comes, the problem of sin is going to be resolved. And if we get that far again tonight in our class, then we'll see that being fulfilled in the New Testament times. Now, here's what I, what I want to spend some time at tonight, and that's in Daniel. Turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel has been put into service of King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, and it confuses him. And so he calls for Daniel to interpret the dream. You're familiar with this? The head of this image that he, says, that he sees in his dream the head is of gold. I'm looking at verse 32 of chapter 2. The breast and the arms are of silver. The belly and thighs are of bronze. And the legs are of iron. Well, what in the world does that mean? What does it symbolize? Now, the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, believed that it was a message from the gods. Well, it was a message from the God, <laughs> not Marduk, not the God of the Babylonians, the God of heaven sent this dream. But God didn't want Nebuchadnezzar's wise men to be able to interpret the dream because that would have led Nebuchadnezzar in the wrong direction. So God designed the dream in such a way that nobody could interpret the dream except God's chosen prophet, and that was Daniel. And so Daniel is called, and Daniel comes to King Nebuchadnezzar, verse 36 Here's the interpretation, verse 37. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, strength, and glory. At the end of verse 38, he says, you are the head of gold. So now we understand that this statue that Nebuchadnezzar has seen in his dream is a symbol of kingdoms. The first kingdom, the head of gold, is the Babylonian kingdom. Verse 39, after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to you. Now we know from the rest of Daniel that that second kingdom, and we also know from history, that second kingdom is the Medo-Persian kingdom. The one that took over the Babylonians. And then also in verse 39, a third kingdom is going to come which will rule over all the earth. That third kingdom we know from the rest of the book of Daniel as well as from history is the kingdom of the Greeks which in your Bible is probably often translated as Javan, J-A-V-A-N, Javan, which is the old word for Greece. And then in verse 40, Daniel says, There will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom, but will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. Now I'm going to drop down to verse 44. Well, let me point this out. Who could be that fourth kingdom? What's the kingdom that took over the Greeks? The Romans. So this terrible beast is the Romans. Now when we get to the book of Revelation, that's going to be important. Now we had, we had a whole three months studying the book of Revelation, so I'm going to give you the book of Revelation condensed into about two Wednesday nights, maybe three. But the book of Revelation is one application of the message of the book of Daniel, and that is the fall of the Romans. 
That's what the book of Revelation is about. The book of Revelation completes the picture of the book of Daniel. This awesome kingdom, this kingdom symbolized by uh, a terrible beast that we'll look at in, in chapter 7. Okay, so now look at verse 44. In the days of those kings, which kings? The ones he just mentioned, the Romans. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all of these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. And as much as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, and the clay, and the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. And we're talking about the revelation of the kingdom of God, right? Daniel says that that kingdom is going to be established during the days of the Roman Empire. Now, as a part of this study, we're going to question that doctrine that says Jesus is going to come back to earth and establish a kingdom for a thousand years. And we're going to find that that's not what the Bible says. And fundamentally, we know that's not true because Daniel says it's going to be established there in the days of the Roman Empire. Now, turn over a few chapters to chapter 7. This is not a study on the book of Daniel. If you want to study the book of Daniel, then you've got to come to Bernie's class on Sunday morning in the small fellowship hall. Donna, you tell him I advertised his class tonight, okay? When's he starting that? He's not finished with Jude yet. Yeah, he's got a couple more weeks to finish Jude, and then he'll be in Daniel. First of February, oh, Yeah. Donna says it's Marvin's fault that it's going so slow. Okay, you just check with Bernie. If you want to sit in on the Daniels class, you just check with Bernie and he'll let you know when he's ready. All right, chapter 7. First year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed and he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Now, the first year of Belshazzar is... is what happens when, when a king begins his reign? What's going on in the kingdom? What happens the first day that a president is sworn into office? Everybody's happy. You're having a party, right? You've got balls and, and, and all of that kind of stuff. Well, that's the same thing that's going on right now in the first year of King Belshazzar. So in the first year that Belshazzar begins his reign, God sends a vision to show Daniel what's going to be happening in the future. So Daniel, verse 2, says, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Out of the sea comes the mass of humanity, right? Four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first one was like a lion had the wings of an eagle. Okay, think back to that image that we just saw in chapter 2. What did the head of gold, who did the head of gold symbolize? Babylon. This first beast, like a lion had the wings of an eagle, symbolizes the nation of Babylon. I kept looking until its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind was given to it. Again, we're not going into detail on this tonight because this is not a study of Daniel. This is a study of the kingdom. Verse 5, Behold, another beast, a second one resembling a bear, and it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth, and thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. What did the second part of the image symbolize in chapter 2. The Persian Empire. So this bear symbolizes the Persian Empire. After this I kept looking, verse 6, and behold another one like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. How about the third part of the image from chapter 2? Greece. Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire. So that's who this, the leopard, symbolizes. Verse 7, 
After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was con contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, the horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and the mouth uttering great boast. Who was the fourth what was the fourth part of the image from chapter 2? Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire is this terrible beast that Daniel sees. But it's in the middle of contemplating that terrible beast that we begin reading verse 9. I kept looking until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Who's the Ancient of Days? Probably God. Okay? He takes a seat. His vesture was like white snow. The hair of the head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him. And the myriads upon marriage were standing before him. The court sat. The books were open. I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking, which was part of that fourth empire. I kept looking until the beast was slain and his body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. Now, I've gone through Daniel primarily to get the verses 13 and 14. Verses 13 and 14 are probably the heart of the whole book of Daniel. Daniel says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Who could this son of man be? He's got to be Jesus. Now, Daniel doesn't understand that because Daniel doesn't understand that the incarnation is happening. Ezekiel uses the phrase son of man more than any other prophet in the Old Testament. And fundamentally, the, the designation son of man is an Aramaic expression that refers to a human being. It simply refers to somebody who has the nature or quality of being human. Daniel takes that expression and he, refer, he uses it to refer to the person who receives this kingdom. Okay, so he's already had two visions where he saw Babylon rises and falls. Medo-Persian Empire rises and falls. The Greek Empire rises and falls. The Roman Empire rises and it's terrible and it's awful. And in the middle of that kingdom, there's going to be another kingdom. The Son of Man, this is verse 13 goes to the Ancient of Days, verse 14, and to him, the Son of Man, was given dominion, glory, a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Are the, are the overriding influence on the gospel of Matthew. Matthew is about Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. The gospel of Matthew is to show that Jesus of Nazareth is that son of man who goes to the Ancient of Days and receives His kingdom. Now we're going to take a few weeks to show that. We're going to walk through the Gospel of Matthew. Have a little bit of Mark, a little bit of Luke, a little bit of John sprinkled in. But largely it's the Gospel of Matthew. So at this point in time, as far as our... our examination of the Old Testament now, we're standing on the very edge of the Old Testament. We're looking over into the coming of the New Testament times. And here is what we're looking for. One like a son of man was coming. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented to him. That's verse 13. 
There in the presence of the Ancient of Days in heaven, he received dominion, glory, and a kingdom. Give me a synonym for dominion. Power. Another synonym? Authority. The word authority and the word power translate one Greek word in the, in the New Testament, exousia. Y'all know this, just before Jesus goes to heaven, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus says, All what has been given unto me in heaven and on earth? All what? Authority or power, depending on your translation. Okay? That's number two. Number three, all people, nations, men of every language are going to serve him. That's verse 14. What does that tell you about the nature of the kingdom? It's going to be universal, isn't it? It's going to be broad. So Daniel is trying to encourage his fellow Jews who are trapped in Babylon. I know you're discouraged. I know you're disappointed that God hasn't fulfilled his promise. But listen, there's going to be a kingdom established that's not going to have any end to it. God is going to establish his kingdom that's not going to have any end to it. Now there is no reason for Daniel to tell him it's going to happen in the Roman Empire because that's not going to, the Roman Empire is not even going to come along for a few hundred years. Here's something else too. You always got to keep in the back of your mind that God's keeping His plan a secret from Satan. Right? 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, if Satan had known God's plans, he would never have crucified Jesus. So God has to reveal His plans in, in, in ways that humans can put two and two together once Jesus comes, but Satan's got to be kept in the dark. So that he doesn't mess up God's plans. Number three. Number four, his dominion would be an everlasting dominion. It would not pass away. It would not be destroyed. So Daniel is telling his Jews, fellow Jews, look, God is going to establish a kingdom that is never going to be destroyed. You have been uprooted from your homeland, but there's going to come a kingdom that's not going to be destroyed. It was to encourage them. Okay, has anybody got any questions up to this point? Because that's all the time we have. Just kidding. So the, the Jews at this time, this is the remnant of the Jews. So we're next on, right? The remnant of the Jews are those who are still faithful to God. Now just because they were in exile doesn't mean they were faithful to God. Because Daniel criticizes and Jeremiah criticizes, uh, Ezekiel criticizes some of his fellow Jews who were in exile, but they still weren't faithful. You know, there are some children you could spank until your arm wears out, and they're still not going to straighten up. So there were some Jews in exile that, that were in exile, and they still weren't living right. So the remnant, the phrase of remnant, is an important concept throughout the prophets, but the remnant refers to that group of Jews who were being faithful to God. They may have been in exile, but they were still going to be faithful to God whether they were in exile or not. Because their hearts belong to God. Other thoughts or comments? Right, so now I've got to repeat everything you just said for people that are watching on live stream. Sorry, I should have <laughs> the Jews here are, are, are having, the faithful Jews, the remnants are having that long-term view. Now, if they're unfaithful Jews, by definition, they've got a short-term view, right? We look around at our fellow Americans, and there's a lot of them that's just got a short-term view. That's why they're not Christians. That's why they're not thinking about heaven or hell. They've got a short-term view. So there were Jews then who had a short-term view. The faithful Jews had the long-term view in mind. They're the ones that are grasping hold of the promise to Abraham and the promise to David and, the, and, and these prophecies like Joel chapter 2 and Isaiah chapter 7, the coming of the virgin, uh, virgin to give birth and so forth. They were holding on to those promises and they were expecting God to fulfill them. They just don't, they didn't know when and they didn't know how. 
But those were messages that these prophets gave to their fellow Jews to keep them encouraged and to keep them faithful. Just like you and I don't know when Jesus is going to come again. Those, those, those Jews didn't know when Jesus was going to come the first time. And my, my suspicion is God does it just to test our faith. That's why he waited 25 years before he fulfilled the promise to Abraham to have a son. Test your faith. I think that's the way, reason why God did that to the Jews and, and the reason why God doesn't tell us when Jesus is coming back. All right, so the Son of Man. The phrase Son of Man is used in the Gospel accounts 84 times. It is an idiom to refer to human beings. I mentioned that. Jesus is setting himself in the context of his prophecy. He's going to receive God's kingdom. He's going to rule over God's kingdom. And that kingdom is not going to ever end. So I want to remind you of these dates. Babylon fell to Persia in 539. Persia fell to Alexander the Great and the Greeks in 334 B.C. Greece fell to Rome ultimately in 31 B.C. And now we're getting time, getting up to the time when Jesus leaves heaven, puts on human flesh, and comes to earth. So, when we put everything together that we've been reading about, and there's obviously much more. This class is not about Jesus fulfilling prophecy, because that would be another three months. I'm just summarizing, okay? Number one, a new descendant of David, who is referred to as the son of David, is supposed to begin, uh, establish the kingdom of God. We've read about that. The descendant will establish a kingdom which will last forever. Kingdom will be established during the days of the Roman Empire. The kingdom will be universal. It will not be only for the Jews. The king will have all dominion, all authority, and all power. And the king will be identified also as the son of man. So if we were one of the remnant of those faithful Jews... Let's say in the year 5 B.C., <laughs> the year before Mary gives birth to Jesus. If we, if we were walking closely with our God, reading His Word regularly, that's what we'd be looking for. Right there. So, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The one fellow? The one fellow named Simeon. Yeah, Luke chapter 2. And there's the woman too, remember? Anna. Anna and Simeon. Looking for the consolation of Israel. Waiting for the redemption of Israel. Both of those words are used in Luke chapter 2 as they're waiting for the regeneration of the nation of Israel. And we might get to the term regeneration tonight. I don't know. Probably not. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. Somebody read the very, first, the very first verse that breaks the silence of the Old Testament period. What does that verse say? The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Incidentally, 11 times the word, this is the book of the generations, is used in the book of Genesis. Matthew opens up quoting that phrase from the book of Genesis, indicating we've got a new Genesis coming. What does the word Genesis mean? The beginning. We've got a new beginning. We always associate John chapter 1 and verse 1 with the book of Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But Matthew also does the same thing with the word, the book of genealogies, the book of the generations. Of Jesus Christ, who? Son of David. Son of David. Let's take a walk through the Gospel of Matthew, looking at who this Son of David is. Matthew's told us that he's introducing us to Jesus, the Son of David. The prophet said the Son of David was coming, and he was going to establish a kingdom. Let's see what Matthew has to say about him. Turn to nine, uh, chapter 9, verse 27. The phrase Son of David is used in chapter 1 and verse 20, but there it refers to Joseph, David's adopted earthly father. Every other time the phrase Son of David is used in the Gospel of Matthew, it refers to Jesus. Okay, somebody read chapter 9, verse 27. All right. 
That's just one verse pulled out of this paragraph. Jesus is in Capernaum, and these blind men want Jesus to heal them, and they call him Son of David. That is significant because in Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6, Isaiah says, In the time of the Messiah, in the time of the Messiah, the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer. The tongue of the mute will shout for joy, for waters will bring, break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. So Isaiah says when the Messiah comes, when the son of David comes, he's going to open the eyes of the blind. He's going to open the ears of the deaf. He's going to make the lame to walk. What does Jesus do? Exactly that. Why? Because he's proven himself to be the son of David. He's going to establish his kingdom. Jesus quotes this or refers to this text in, in chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, when John the baptizer sends some of his disciples to Jesus. Are you the coming one or should we look for another? John was beginning to have some doubts because of what he had experienced. Jesus says, you go back to John and you tell him Isaiah chapter 35 is being fulfilled. John chapter 7 and verse 31. Somebody read that verse for us. Out loud. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? Do you see that? The Jews in Jesus' day, we're talking about those faithful Jews, they were expecting the Messiah to perform signs. They looked at the signs that Jesus was performing and they said, can anybody do more signs than him? Isaiah chapter 35. The son of David is coming. He's going to perform these miracles. All right, turn over to chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Let's look at another use of the phrase son of David. And in this particular context, what does it show? Somebody read Matthew 12 verses 22 and 23. So Jesus heals this man of demon possession. And the people draw the conclusion, could he be the son of David? Why did Jesus perform miracles? To prove he was the son of David. Not just a descendant of David. You have to understand this term son of David has got theological weight in it. He's the Messiah. He's the one that's going to establish the kingdom. Not only that, drop down to verse 28. Dylan, go ahead and read verse 28, chapter 12. Meditate on that verse. Jesus has just performed a miracle. He's just cast out an evil spirit from this man. He makes him be able to speak and hear. Jesus says, if I, by the Spirit of God, cast out evil spirits, then you need to understand that the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, we're faithful Jews. We're part of the remnant. We're looking forward to that kingdom being established. When's it going to be established? Jesus says, if I can perform miracles, know that the kingdom of heaven is about to be established. Chapter 15, verse 22. Next time the phrase son of David is used. This is also a very significant text for this phrase. Somebody read that verse for us. Yes, ma'am. So this Canaanite woman from the Syrophoenician area of Israel wants Jesus to cast out an evil spirit from her daughter. What is significant about this woman? She is not a Jew. She's a Canaanite. What did Daniel prophesy about the coming kingdom? It's going to be universal. All nations are going to be a part of this kingdom. Now we've got a woman who is not a Jew who recognizes in Jesus Christ that he is the son of David. I don't know how much she understood about the coming son of David. But she saw in Jesus the son of David. And she wasn't a Jew. 
Chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. What we're doing is just walking through the Gospel of Matthew, looking at every time the phrase Son of Man is used, Son of David is used. That's what we're doing. Matthew told us he's going to introduce us to Jesus, the Son of David. Chapter 20, 30 and 31. Somebody read those two verses for us. All right, so a second time, this is outside the city of Jericho this time, the second time Jesus opens the eyes of the blind. Why? Because he's the son of David and he can do that. That's what Isaiah says. Let's jump down, chapter 21, verse 9. In chapter 21, Jesus is entering into Jerusalem. We call it the triumphal entry. In what role is Jesus entering Jerusalem? He enters Jerusalem as a... King. Okay, somebody read chapter 21 and verse 9. Okay, so the crowds recognize Jesus as king. The crowds, largely speaking, want Jesus to be an earthly king, right? They're not thinking in terms of getting rid of sin. They're thinking in terms of getting rid of the Roman Empire. They think Jesus is going to throw off the yoke of the Roman Empire and lead Israel back into the golden age of, of prominence that they had under the kings David and Solomon. And when Jesus doesn't fulfill that role, they crucify him. But on this particular point, they're, they're, they're treating him correctly. They're treating him as a king. Now, incidentally, Jesus is not riding on a stallion. What's he riding on? A borrowed donkey. Why? Because Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9 prophesied that the king would enter the city in humility. Riding on a donkey. So Jesus is a king, yes, but he's not the kind of king that most people expect. Okay, back to verse 9. The crowds... They cut down the branches. They lay them on the ground. They put their coats over the donkeys. Uh, the donkey in the fold. Jesus obviously only rides on one of them, not both of them. But they put the blankets on them, and Jesus sits on them. And then they shout out, and they quote Psalms 118, verse 26. The Hallel Psalms are those songs that begin and end with Hallelujah. <laughs> so they're called Hallel Psalms. Hallelujah means praise Jehovah. Verse 26 is the verse that they're citing in specifically in verse uh, 9. And they sing, Hosanna to who? The Son of David. They recognize now in Jesus that He is the Son of David. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, the Jewish leaders don't like this. They come along and they criticize Jesus. They're indignant that He won't shut those people up. Verse 15. They say to him, do you hear what these children are saying? And notice Jesus' response. Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise for yourself? God, uh, Jesus says God is the one who's motivated these people to say this. Jesus is quoting Psalms 8, verse 2. The Hebrew writer... We're getting ahead of ourselves. But the Hebrew writer taught, takes Psalms 8 and applies it to Jesus. Here Jesus says, God motivates nursing babes and infants to praise Him. They're in fact praising who? Jesus. To praise Jesus is to praise God. Alright, Son of David... The next verse, chapter 22, 41 through 46. How much time we've got? Ten minutes. Turn over to chapter 22, 41 through 46. This is a, a significant text, and, and it would be good for us to spend even more time on this text, but we'll spend a little bit of time on it, maybe the next ten minutes. 22, 41 through 46. Somebody read those six verses for us.
They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, Then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from the, that day on to ask him another question. Okay, this is the last week of Jesus on earth. This is probably Tuesday of his last week. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians have been coming to Jesus and throwing question after question after question at him, trying to get him to trip up, trying to get him to say something that will either anger the civil leader so that they would do something with Jesus or anger the crowd so that they would turn their backs on Jesus. Jesus, of course, answered their questions one after another with impeccable logic and scripture and just shut them up. In fact, you may remember when we talked about the Sadducees asking the question about the resurrection, when it says that Jesus silenced the Sadducees, he used a Greek verb that means he muzzled them. They walked away from Jesus with a muzzle. <laughs> they, just, they didn't have anything else to say. Now Jesus puts a question to them. Who's the Messiah? Who's the Christ? The rabbis correctly understood he, he's the son of David. Then Jesus quotes Psalms 110, verse 1. How does David in the Spirit call him Lord? Notice, first of all, that Jesus believes David wrote by the Holy Spirit. It's Holy Spirit's words. David's quill, Holy Spirit's words. So the Spirit says through David, that's Psalms 110, verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, now in the English translations, this can get confusing. In the Hebrew, these are two different words. The first Lord is Jehovah. The second Lord is Adonai in the Hebrew, which means master. So David says, Jehovah says to my master, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. Now, the Jews understood this, David's writing this, to be referring to his son. And that's correct. So then Jesus comes back and says, if David calls him Lord, how's he his son? There's two points to draw from this. Number one, if David can call his son Lord, then his son has a higher rank than he does. That's an indication of the divine nature of the son of David. That's an indication of the divine nature of the Messiah. The implication is that this, the Messiah is God in the flesh. But Jesus is trying to get them to think about who the son of David is. The second point is to recognize this. Understanding that David is talking about his son, the Lord says to my master, sit at my right hand. Who can sit at the right hand of Jehovah God? Only his son who has the same nature. Only a divine person could sit on a throne beside Jehovah God. Now that gives the Jews something to chew on too. So they're going to walk away saying, wow. Wow. The Messiah equals the son of David, who equals God. You see, Jesus trying to give these Jewish people a better understanding, a better concept of who Jesus is. Still in Psalms 110, I just want to point this out. In verse 4, the Lord also says that this Lord, who is this master who's going to be sitting on his right hand, he's going to be a priest forever, according to the pattern set by Melchizedek. Now, we're not going to spend time talking about Mel Melchizedek in this class because it's not about Melchizedek. But the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 7 gives an exhaustive discussion about Melchizedek and how Jesus fulfills the role of Melchizedek and so, when you look back at Psalms 110, verse 1 shows that this Messiah is going to be king. Verse 4 shows that the Messiah is going to be a priest. That's significant. 
Because when we're talking about the revelation of the kingdom of God, at the point when Jesus is able to offer a sac uh, salvation for sins as a priest, that's the same time he begins reigning as king. In Zechariah chapter 6, verses 11 through 15, the prophet Zechariah also pictures the branch, that's the sprout of Jesse, who's referring to David, that's Isaiah 11 verse 1, so Zechariah says the branch is going to reign as a priest on his throne. And when we come back next week and we start looking at the use of the phrase Son of Man, so we've got to bring that into the conversation. When we look at the, the phrase Son of Man, we find where Jesus says the Son of Man has power on earth to do what? forgive sins. So when Jesus is able to offer the forgiveness of sins, it's also when he starts reigning as king. That's when we know the kingdom is established. We're just laying the groundwork. We're just letting the scriptures guide us as we lay a groundwork for learning about the establishment of the kingdom of God. Son of David is used three times in the Gospel of Mark. All of those three times are just repetitions of the same context that we saw in the Gospel of Matthew. Luke uses the expression also three times. Two of those times are repetitions in the Gospel of Matthew. One of those times is chapter 3, verse 31. Chapter 3, verse 31, Luke tells us that Mary... Jesus' mother was descended from Nathan, who was a son of David. So in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus, he shows that Jesus is a descendant of David through his dad. In Luke's account, Jesus showed, Luke shows that Jesus is a descendant of David through his mom. So Jesus was the son of David from both sides of the family. We'll stop there. Well, let me go ahead and give this one. There's not that much to talk about in this one. Son of David is not used in the Gospel of John. In fact, the phrase son of David is not used in the whole rest of the New Testament. Which shows us that it is primarily a term favored by Matthew. Now... The word Christ is used 477 times from Acts through Revelation. That is the New Testament writer's favorite designation for Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. And in fact, his earthly name, Jesus, which means Savior, is only used 353 times in Acts through Revelation. Which means Paul and Peter and James and Jude, they all much preferred to call him Christ, even over calling him Jesus. Now that's where we'll stop. Because next time we look at the Son of Man in Matthew. And we'll learn more about who this man is who's supposed to establish his kingdom. Any other comments or questions before we have a prayer? We wish you a happy New Year's. If you're a Michigan fan, good luck. And if you're an Alabama fan, good luck. <laughs> Alabama doesn't need to snooze on Cincinnati. They're a good team. If Cincinnati wins, then I'll be happy for Tyler Powers. He's a graduate of Cincinnati. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time we can spend together this evening feeding on your word. We pray, Father, that it will strengthen our faith and encourage us in our walk with you. Keep us safe and, again, bless our holidays. Bring us back together, Father, on the Lord's day as we assemble around the Lord's table. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.